Some of you may know um, that Bob Fisher had a spouse of many years, the poet and prophet, who passed away a year ago. And um, many of you may have known him. He was a very fine poet. Um, this show is really the first public work that Bob has done since then. And of course, he wishes that Ed could be here, and he asked me, as part of the reading before I read my own poems, if I would read two of uh, Ed's favorite poems that he had written. Um, I like them very much, he was a very fine poet, and they're quite humorous, I'm sure you'll enjoy them. The first one is Cockamamie. Cocks are all like snowflakes, none is just the same. Hmm. One is long and thin, another short and fat, or fat and long, or somewhere in between. I know a fellow who had one no bigger than a bloated clitoris. He said his wife had no complaint. And once I had a guy whose men were stretched a bit above his knees. Alas, it never got quite hard. One goes up and one goes down, and when you're lucky, one goes straight ahead. The reach has quirks peculiar to its own. Tomas twists to the left, and Thomas to the right. I myself, both long and thin, am bent before the head. And as to heads, one boy I had had one that could have been a German helmet. Another one had one shape just like a cord. According to the laws of natural selection, just a single type should long ago have come to dominate, like peacock tails or walrus tusks. So what on earth, as Freud bemused and Darwin couldn't entertain, do women want? <laughs> and uh, this one is called Carpe Victus. <laughs> I hope I'm told I have six months to live instead of simply dropping dead someplace. I've long ago endured a meager diet just to stay a little overweight. But if I got my brothers, I intend to have an orgy of those tiny cocktail friends, potato chips and avocados by the carlo, deviled eggs and sauce grenades, all go out of the blaze of mayonnaise. Yes. I'd start right now. But I have promises to keep and miles to go before I eat. Does <laughs> anybody <laughs> <laughs> know how to adjust this mic so we don't have that echo? It's kind of overwhelming. Julia was so quiet. Okay. Can you hear me? Is mm -hmm. it still working? Good. Okay, and here's three of my own. Urges. I have the urge to make a bonfire with poems torn from the New Yorker. To invade every emergency room in America and demand that poetry be resuscitated. I want to play jazz on the Golden Gate Bridge to a flotilla of monks and nuns sailing past with hundreds of ecstatic children to jack off in a cranberry bog on Cape Cod while flying a kite. <laughs> it would be nice to brew great coffee on a fall afternoon as we talk in your bedroom exchanging massages. Then I would clean your dirty windows so you can see me outside at sunrise posing naked on my perfect feet. And later, I will lose my eyeglasses in your bedclothes. I have the inclination to eat artichokes and snails with all my poet friends at the fanciest restaurant in America and send the bill to the New Yorker. <laughs> Is it easy to make a poem? Is it easy to make a poem? Yes, it is easy to make a poem because the sun is shining and outside my studio window an American flag is blowing in the wind like a leaf caught in a tornado flapping itself into oblivion. You see, metaphors are everywhere. It is easy to make a poem because my heart is packed with the wonder of my friends and the way we look at one another and see the universe in each other's eyes because it is summer and last night there was a meteor shower and I was there to see it. Because I woke up this morning and smelled the coffee, 
and went to share breakfast with a pal with a greasy spoon and gossiped and felt happy to be alive. Is it easy to make a poem? Of course it's easy to make a poem. But it's fucking hard to make a good one. <laughs> <laughs> and last, who paints? For months, I didn't go to the studio. I have given away my entire body of work, completed over six years. The ones I couldn't sell, they are gone. And I am gone from the studio. I wonder whether I will too ever find the track back to the painting self. Until a friend with art gallery offers me space, says, I will be a supported artist. I get a hand up, I suppose, like a circus performer on a trapeze. I think of old de Kooning, senile and wet lane, each morning placed on a chair, brushes handed to him and colors laid out, the assistant stand by waiting for genius. I go with misgiving and doubt to the art house, where my friend's gallery is a strange and disturbing place to me. With punk music, his preference, not mine, lasting through the loudspeakers, I enter off an alley and have to step over homeless folk, several, sleeping on cardboard on the pavement. Me, artist, smartest, I think. And then I'm there, alone, with the canvas. And I start to splash and play, looking for something to say. I make a wash of green, no, yellow, no, red, no, wait. But the black paint is at hand like fate, and slowly, something emerges. Aborigines in Australia do not take credit for the paintings they make. The spirit paints, they say, painting is a kind of possession. Hmm.